Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 85 of the podcast. It's the 16th of August, 2017, as I record this intro. And my guest this week is Lucy Aiken-Reed, an unschooling mom of two. You may know her from her blog, Lulastic and the Hippie Shake, or her YouTube channel. Her journey toward unschooling began when her first child was born. Her daughter's incredibly spirited nature caused Lucy to ask herself a lot of questions about how she wanted to raise her children. She and her husband have taken their journey outward as well, selling their London home to travel around Europe and then on to New Zealand. We chat about what their move to unschooling has looked like, what's been the hardest part so far, what's been the most surprising, as well as her thoughts on her husband's journey to unschooling. As a personal update, this week I get to say I sent my book manuscript to my editor. Yay! (laughs) As I mentioned on Facebook, for me, the book's now in a resting stage, which actually means it's swirling around in the back of my mind at all times. I've already started writing notes to myself for when I get to dive back in. I really love this book. And I want to say thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And a big welcome to new patrons Stevie Puckett and Allie Grace. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. You guys inspire me. And I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. If you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And the quote I want to share this week is from Lucy. It's not really so much about the very specific practical details as much as the big picture of the life you're trying to lead, which is one where you're not making decisions based on fear, but you're making decisions based on connection. And having that overall philosophy is what makes then the details make sense. That was such a great point. When we're new to something like unschooling, it's natural to want to know the practical details. How do we do it? When this happens, should we do A or B? But our situation is different. What should we do? Learning something new is this amazingly chaotic swirl of trying out the practical details, the actions, while contemplating the bigger picture, and then paying attention to see what pieces connect and settle out of that swirl. That's how you build a bigger picture understanding of unschooling, discovering how the practical details connect to the philosophy. And I think that's what Sandra Dodd is getting at with her wonderful mantra for new unschoolers. Read a little, try a little, wait a while, watch. Eventually, the details make sense in the bigger picture. You no longer feel like you're trying to adhere to the, quote, rules of unschooling. Instead, you are choosing to do these things because they mesh with the philosophy you are wanting to live in your family's lives. So even though the daily practical details may not have changed much, your motivation and understanding behind them has changed like night to day. The de-schooling journey is pretty incredible. And now, let's go chat with Lucy. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Lucy Aiken-Reed. Hi Lucy! Hi, Pam. How are you going? I'm going very well. Just to let everyone know, Lucy is an unschooling mom of two kids, and I have been following her adventures online for quite a while now, including her family's experiences living in a yurt in New Zealand, and now their travels back to the UK. So I'm really looking forward to diving into her unschooling and de-schooling experiences at this point on her journey. And to get us started, Lucy, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Yeah, of course. So um, I'm Lucy and I'm married to Tim and 
He is a Kiwi, but we spent most of our early marriage in London, where I'm from. And that's where we had both of our daughters, Ramona, who's now six, and Juno, who is four. Uh, We lived really happily, um, living quite a normal life, I suppose, in London until a couple of years ago when we decided to sort of up sticks and move to a forest in New Zealand where we now, yeah, live in a yurt, basically. (laughs) That is so awesome, Lucy, and I'm sure you're going to share some amazing stories from that time as we go through this. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe you can share with us how you actually discovered unschooling. How'd you come across it? Well, yeah, it's quite interesting for me because I guess um, deep in my heart, I'm a bit of a socialist and I always uh, really held on to the idea of school as being a really important common good and that uh, my children would definitely go to school. We would support that school uh, because, you know, education uh, is something that every child deserves and people who are able to input into their local school, you know, it's a really great thing that we should support. Basically, I had a really strong belief around that. And then I had my children and, and my first child, Ramona, really took me on a huge learning curve, I guess. Um, she's a child with who is just incredibly spirited. And, um, and I believe that her spirited nature um, caused me to ask a lot of questions about how I wanted to raise my children. Uh, when our second child, Juno, was born, uh, yep, we sold everything in our London home and we sold our London home and we... Uh, packed our bags into a VW camper van and we went traveling around Europe. And as uh, someone had given me John Holt's How Children Learn, you know, which is always a slippery slope once you pick <laughs> up a John Holt book, I think. <laughs> so I was kind of reading this probably a little um, skeptically, but also knowing um, that I was already raising Ramona in quite a radically different way to how I sort of thought I would. So I guess. I was, my mind was already beginning to open about some of these ideas about uh, raising children respectfully, for sure. Um, but then uh, we went to a forest kindergarten in the Black Forest in Germany as part of our big trip around Europe, uh, which we were doing. We'd set aside six months to do that. And then we got to this forest kindergarten and I was reading How Children Learn. And I think it just was like a potent combination for my mind. So I was reading John Holt. And seeing all of these children around me, basically just unschooling in the great outdoors. So there are teachers there and they're well-trained teachers, but they see themselves much more as facilitators for a child's own learning. And um, yeah, it was just so incredible to see it in real life, in action, exactly uh, what John Holt is talking about. And I guess that was a moment when I knew that we would be unschoolers and that all these ideas I held about school uh, weren't actually necessarily uh, going to be the reality for my family. And so then we we ended up back in New Zealand uh, with our kids. And uh, even though Ramona was only three at that stage and Juno was a tiny baby, we rocked up in New Zealand and immediately attended an unschooling camp. (laughs) And there were just, yeah, 150 people there. And we just kind of arrived there and we just felt like we'd found our people. This was a community that we wanted to... Um, stay within and raise our children within. So I guess uh, that's the story. <laughs> How did you hear about the camp? Was it just uh, I Googled it, yeah. Oh. So I actually Googled um, unschooling NZ. Mm-hmm. And um, instead of any websites coming up or any groups or resources, um, there was just uh, an event, uh, you know, detailing where to turn up and how much to pay. <laughs> and we were like, okay. Let's do it. <laughs> Google has spoken. Yeah. It well, and and that is such a a nice introduction. Like actually in person, I I know when I first came across unschooling, you know, it was it was all online. There wasn't like local um, yeah. gatherings that I knew of. Um, so I mean, I still made all those con- those connections came so fast and made so much yeah. sense at the point that I was there. But definitely seeing it in action would be would be a, a, a nice introduction, right? 
Yeah, it was it was really, really cool. And there were definitely a few sort of moments where we're like, oh, that's interesting. You know? <laughs> um, it wasn't <laughs> at all like, you know, oh, we do everything exactly this way. It wasn't yeah. at all like that. Yeah. Um, but it was the community that mm-hmm. um, really inspired us, I guess. And um, and we really just felt at home within uh, the way that the adults were interacting with the children, because that was something we really felt certain about at that stage. We really knew that we wanted to be parents that interacted with our children in a really respectful kind of democratic way I suppose and and that is what we saw there and that was probably the magic for us that made us go oh yeah this is something we're gonna really dive into and um and now we actually go to uh, between four and five unschooling camp a year they're really important part of our family's uh, unschooling framework I guess mm-hmm. and all of that just a whole massive group of people are just uh, being in their element for a few days um, every season. Uh, we make it happen uh, come hell or high water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And and you mentioned there too that that already before you even you know came across John Hold et cetera that your parenting was was less mainstream, right? So you were kind of um, already primed for that. So you noticed the difference in the relationships, even just at camp, even if some of the details still weren't uh, ready for you. Because it really is a journey, isn't it? Because the more you understand, because I remember at first I would read about unschooling and I'd I'd think, well, you know, it's super cool. So much of it makes sense. You know, this little bit, I don't think we'll do that. I don't think we'll be doing that. But as the months went by and I learned more and more and I understood why they were doing that, yeah. It, yeah, it really was a journey because it's like, oh, of course I'm going to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And I see it a lot like with my writing is I'll be writing about some sort of specific and then people will really kind of grab hold of that specific and be like, I can't see how that can possibly work, da, 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 da. And it's like, well, I mean, I guess it really does only work in when you look at the whole picture. It's sort of like uh, people really want the detail, but... Um, I mean, the devil, isn't it? No, that's <laughs> the devil in the detail. But you know, it's not really so much about the very specific practical details as much as like the big picture of the life you're trying to lead, which is one where you're not making decisions based on fear, but you're making decisions based on connection. And, and having that overall philosophy is what makes then the details make sense. So true. And I don't know is, if I made sense. <laughs> it did. Absolutely. Because, you know, if you look for the details too quickly, I think there's a tendency to kind of interpret them like the rules of unschooling, right? Yeah, well, tell me exactly. exactly what you do each day and I will do that. But it's not going to yeah. make, it might not work in your family, right? Because it's yeah. all about how the yeah. individuals relate to each other and how the individuals like to pursue their interests and everything. So what my yep. day looks like isn't going to look like anyone else's, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about your family's uh, move to unschooling. So you went to the camp and and uh, it, it made sense. It connected. You guys love that. Um, did, did your days just real, just kind of just keep on going or how did that work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so basically nothing changed, I guess, yeah. Like we just kept on just living our life and that's the thing that, you know, cause we've never been to school. Um, we just keep living our life and nothing has really changed much at all. So the life that we were living with our children age two, uh, or one and three, uh, is now pretty similar to age six and four, really. Um, I guess um, they're way more vocal in what they want to do. Um, but we still just go about living our lives, all of us um, ticking away, following our little hopes and dreams each day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, there's not been any momentous shift, I don't think, since that camp. It's just been living each day as it comes to us. Mm-hmm. So you just just kind of kept on keeping on. That's awesome. Have kept on have, keeping on. Yeah. <laughs> Did your have your kids mentioned school at all? Yeah. So um, Ramona uh, does sort of every now and then mention school, um, and we. 
it's nearly always when there's been a bit of a time in our life where we've um, been quite farm bound for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, she's an incredibly social kid. And I think uh, sometimes when we drive past the playground, she'll see uh, the hundreds of kids kind of just running around there and she'll think, oh, I do really well in that situation. Um, so so we tend to work really hard at, at getting her enough of that social interaction. And when that's going really well, uh, she she doesn't mention school at all. She knows that she's getting all her social needs met. And um, every now and then when she does um, pop out with this sort of question about school, um, I can almost always look around us and see that we've maybe dropped going to something um, or we've been a little bit caught up with all our farm chores and haven't quite managed to meet up with as many people as we usually do or that sort of thing. And uh, one of her best friends started going to school for a couple of weeks and she was quite in intrigued by school at that point, which was uh, really interesting for us. It it was somebody that we live on a farm with um, and they're an unschooling family, but um, their boy wanted to give it a go. And so they did. And and that was really interesting because we were, I guess we had to ask ourselves the question, um, you know, would Ramona go to school if she wanted it? And um, we sort of did a bit of soul searching about that around that time and then um then he decided it wasn't actually all that you know he liked having a lunchbox and um he liked having play dates after school and his mum realized that both of those things could be done outside of a school context <laughs> <laughs> and um and he didn't like being told what to do when and where so um he really quickly just went back to to being at home on the farm and and then that moment was kind of just kind of disappeared but it's always an interesting one to to figure out whether you know in your unschooling family you would be willing to support a child going to school yeah that's such a big because you know when I I, I mean I know my experience and um, I imagine other people's you know when it first gets mentioned um, it can knock you off a bit just because you yeah. feel like, well, what am I not doing? What am I not doing? But if, yeah. you know, what's wrong? Am I failing? Am I not doing it right? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But yeah, so it takes that soul searching, that work to get past that reaction and realize, yeah. you know, this isn't personal. But like you said, it's a great clue to start looking around, you know, and yeah. s- you see that that question, it, it's it might be just um, the solution that they see to a need that's missing, right? Yeah, it, like you exactly. said, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a need. Maybe it's a need um, for some more social interaction, and they think so. They're not going to come to you, mom. I need more social interaction, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. she may, you know, see in her mind that playground full of kids at school and think school is a good solution, and and yeah. and then come at, come at it that way. So, so often. Well, I think anytime the first thing is to to look around like you do and see if there's any clues to what need they're trying to fill with that. And then, yeah, yeah, because then from there you can say, well, maybe it it's um, the need is literally to check out school. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but it might not be. There might be a million other ways to meet the, yeah. whatever it is that they want. It, it's it's a hard time, but it's so interesting and and when you can get past yeah. that initial fear, it's it's such a it's a big release to do that soul searching, figure that out because you're in a stronger place, aren't you? And the next time something else yeah. comes up. Yeah, definitely. And I I think um it might who is it? It might be Peter Gray. Let me have a little bit of a think about that. But but someone speaks about this idea that if a child uh, really wants to go to school and they don't get to go, go to school, um, they might forever feel like school was a club that they weren't allowed mm-hmm. in. Yeah. Um, and that is probably something to worry about more than your child actually going to school and you being really kind of phlegmatic about it Mm -hmm. and I think that's I kind of came to two conclusions um I suppose with this whole soul-searching period (laughs) and that was that um I think uh six is I I really felt like six was too young Mm -hmm. to um 
make a decision to put yourself into a situation that so drastically impacts your family's circumstances and your own well-being. And I Mm -hmm. sort of do think that school really does impact a child's well-being. And um, and I guess I wanted, I decided that I wanted to try and protect Ramona from that for as long as I could until she uh, made it really clear that, no, it is school that she's after. So I would try and meet her needs as much as I could, um, you know, and, and then if it still is school, then I would kind of support her to do that but I would do it in a way that supported her as a person without making all of the school's toxicness uh, something that impacts her so you know I'd be very um, nonchalant shall we say (laughs) about Mm -hmm. sort of testing and exams and homework you know all of that stuff I'd just hold really lightly um, but support her in going to school um, if it really was the need that she had to do that. Yeah, and I think that's such a an important point because you're you're so right about um, the atmosphere and the environment and the effect that it can have on a child, and to to realize that it can be such a different experience for a child if if we choose not to bring all that home, right? Mm, yeah. it, it, you know, if we don't buy into. Um, you know, I need to be on top of them at home to study and, and, and to use their grades as a, as a judgment of them and everything, um, rather than just, it's a place they go for a few hours and did they have fun and supporting them if they, it's like, if they're like, mom, I have a test, you know, this week I'd like to study. Can you help me study or something? Of course you're going to help them, but when Yeah, but when you don't, you know, because I can I can see, you know, if we if we're still feeling resentful about their choice, like it was a choice against us, how yeah, we could so easily. Well, you chose school, you know, you have to finish your homework. You have to, yeah. start, you know, to make it as bad as it can be in hopes that they <laughs> leave. But that's that's just going to hurt. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess um, that's why I really like to take uh, the school out of unschooling, you know, and I suppose Mm -hmm. it's why I talk more about this other concept, which we might address later on. Um, Because for me, it's uh, not about education or even learning, actually, but it's more about the relationship you have with your child. So if there's any one thing that you're totally hung up on, um, it's a good sign that it's moved away from being about the important partnership you have with your child and um, it's become, uh, you know, an unhealthy fixation or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we talk on our Q&A episodes so much about whenever there's an issue, go back to the, re- the relationship, right? It, yeah. Does this feel connecting or disconnecting? And choose exactly. the, the actions that, that feel connecting because... Yeah, no matter the environment, you're right. It really does all boil down to relationships. And you know what? It, during my deschooling, that was not that that, that it keeps going. <laughs> yeah. but, any, but anyway, the realization, you know, because at first my kids left school and it's like, okay, so I'm replacing the learning that they're not getting at school. But the the realization after a few months that it's not really about the learning because the learning is going to naturally happen if I keep the relationships, you know, strong and connected, everything yeah. else is going to flow from there. So I love that point. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I was wondering if you might share a little bit about your husband's journey. Um, was unschooling a new kind of idea for him? And how did you guys work together along the way? Okay, so um, unsurprisingly, my husband is a teacher by trade, and I say unsurprisingly because I know a huge number of teachers in the unschooling world. So many. (laughs) Yeah, it's like as if their experience in the classroom, you know, actually is the thing that opens their eyes and says there has to be a better way to treat our children and for our children to learn in a really joyful way. So, um, yep, Tim is a teacher uh, by trade, and he did that for quite a few years, but these days 
days, um, he focuses more on a, a bit of youth work, uh, which for him is what it was all about. It was being able to, um, you know, help young people uh, find their way in the world um, by having really healthy connections and relationships with them. So, um, yeah, teacher by trade. And uh, he really gets the learning stuff for sure. Like we have, uh, we check in, not formally, but uh, just you know, by nature of the whole mm -hmm. thing, once or twice a month about little interesting learning points that have happened with Ramona and Gino. And um, I guess it's his teacher training uh, makes him do that perhaps more than me. So he'll he'll point out something that Ramona's done, which is uh, such a classic learning point, but that she's come to it completely by herself using something, you know, an everyday situation. Um, yeah, so he's he's completely on board with the uh, learning side of it. And I guess both of us are still on this learning journey about um, living democratically and consensually with our children. Um, yeah, so we, we're both trying really hard to read as much as we can and talk together as much as we can. Um, you know, and I guess the challenge is constantly how in a family of four, you can all feel as though your needs can be met and that, you know, it can be win-win for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, well, that, that parenting, the parenting side of the journey that we're always learning because they're always getting older. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so there's like, always yeah, something right. new. <laughs> yeah, I do like to think, though, that every bit of learning you've done, is, you know, paves the way for the next bit of learning. And right now with a kind of um, really incredibly uh, amazing and opinionated and determined six-year-old I'm thinking um, about how much this is paving the way for those incredibly opinionated and determined teenage years <laughs> you know we're gonna be yeah. just like so radically on board with everything they want to do by the time they're teenagers because we'll have developed this sort of trust and uh, you know acceptance so I'm quite excited about the future really oh. um or maybe that's just incredibly hopeful <laughs> well I mean I'll, I'll just share my experience a little bit no I mean the groundwork that you're laying now and those those first um couple of years you know of of really doing all this work to figure out um the ways we all like communicate our needs and, and, and it's even about figuring out our needs because we're not used to that, you know, even as adults to be able to, you know, just reasonably say I, I'm tired yeah. or, you know, to, to really bring um, ourselves to the moment without being manipulative about it. Yeah. 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 To just to just bring all our stuff lightly, like you were talking about before, and um, finding ways to work through them and find those, you know, kind of win, win, win um, opportunities for us to move forward. And I must say, by the time my kids, you know, got to their early teens and through their teen years, it was never... Um, argumentative it was never you know um issues that way at all mostly it was mm. me stretching my comfort zones <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because they knew themselves so well and the trust that we had together like I knew they weren't making choices or wanting to do things um that they didn't think they were capable of doing Mm -hmm. there's the way to put it you know they were choosing things for reasons of their own that made sense and that they felt ready to do yeah so when I was ready to stretch my comfort zones and help them accomplish those things like we were so we were never at odds it was all finding ways for um myself to support them in in ways that I was also comfortable enough with you yeah, know when yeah. my daughter was 13 and wanted to go you know into clubs for shows yeah I for me to be comfortable I just said sure I'll go with you 
Yeah. You know, you know, so, so we, we did that, but yeah, so it was never, it never be, it never felt like butting heads. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I think you're right. That was a long way to say you're right. You're building an amazing (laughs) foundation. (laughs) No, I loved hearing. I, I always absolutely love hearing from people, um, who have older children and who have been through, um, those teenagers because they're so, um, you know, like we talk about those teenage years as if it's some kind of impending horror show, I suppose. <laughs> and um, I mean, I suppose mine was a little bit of a horror show for my parents, but I had an incredibly different upbringing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, But I really believe it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I really believe that this partnership that we're developing with our kids now is something that lasts for, you know, your whole life long. Um, you know, and one of the things as well, I think that unschooling has done for me has... It's made me trust everyone a lot more. So um, my children have asked that of me. Um, and But it's something that I can extend now to everyone. I've become much, much, much less controlling about all these different situations. Like I can remember in the early years of our marriage, I would I'd be texting everyone, trying to get them in the right place at the right time, you know, and yeah. um kind of guessing what people's needs were and trying to kind of preempt how we could get them met and 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 I would just never do that now I just sort of sit back and just sort of see how I could uh you know support someone to get their needs met or uh you know perhaps I can't and I just need to trust that they're making good decisions for themselves and that's something that you know extends from my children to my in-laws to my neighbor you know it it kind of is a, a really cool um stance for all relationships I think I just love that Lucy and what's really funny is I'm writing a book about the unschooling journey and this is what I've been writing about this week oh cool yeah that point where you can see um you realize it it's it's about being human and it applies to everyone and and you lose that need to try and control other people quote you know for their own good because you know the best way things will work out so smoothly and when because a few after you do it a few times isn't it just amazing all the places that thing the the ways um things end up working out like even better than we could have imagined at first right and tried to control it to a but b was so much more awesome (laughs) i know like seriously i i talk about this a huge amount like the ridiculousness of um taking a step back and just being like look there's i'm not gonna get involved in this so i'm just gonna see what happens and then the thing that happens is so much more better than anything you could have planned for um yeah it's actually it feels serendipitous and Mm -hmm. but maybe it's because it's the way the world is meant to work you're just not you're not meant to be hung up on everybody else's choices <laughs> yeah I mean it sounds so obvious when we we're, we're talking about it but um it's really not obvious and I think uh I had a quite a few anguished years because uh, I felt that I had an important role to play in in lots of other people's lives mm-hmm. oh no I I I I totally can remember the just the uptightness back then of, of trying to make sure everything worked out, you know, yeah. that there needed to be plan X, Y, Z, and we need to follow it. And if we didn't, I was getting myself so frustrated and worked up. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> I guess we don't need to talk about that forever, but, but it's such a <laughs> huge <probably> part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we could share a million stories, I'm sure. Um, but I was wondering what you have found to be the I guess the most challenging or the hardest part of your unschooling journey so far? Or was that um, it? <laughs> oh, is well, that's been like a definite shift. Um, the hardest challenge. Um, so probably not it's not so it's not the hardest thing, but it's it's been um the challenging thing has been I guess unschooling has taken me on a journey to sort of ask questions about all sorts of different things and to really uh, try and dismantle um, you know institutionalized thinking and it's it's a journey that I'm really appreciative of but it's been a journey that has definitely shaken the ground beneath my feet a little bit Um, so like I was raised in a church and I was raised in the Salvation Army which is quite uh, um, you know it's really beautiful social justice loving movement of 
people, but it's also quite, um, you know, I guess regimented or um, Mm -hmm. ordered at least. And um, yeah, it's been interesting for me to sort of look at at institutions that um, I've been raised in and that have always provided a sort of structure to my life and, and just try and hold on to the really good and beautiful parts of those things while, um, you know, really asking questions about the healthiness of other parts of it. And, um, and I guess what it comes down to is this sort of imperialist history of, you know, the human race, which is quite a big deal. Maybe we shouldn't really go there. (laughs) And, you know, but when you look historically, like we have, um, you know, the last, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years we've been living in an incredibly controlled hierarchical society uh, that is really really unhealthy and I guess that was um, an unexpected challenge for me was uh, to to kind of become uh, a bit of an anarchist I mean not quite an anarchist but to just sort of like um, yeah just mm-hmm. want to dismantle some of those structures in society that that I don't think are very healthy and and move away from from those that have been a, a had a really important role in my life so yeah that's probably been the biggest challenge I think oh I think that's a great one because I know when we start we don't realize how far reaching it's going to be do we mm, no no it's it's amazing once you start um you know, realizing that that choice is choice is important, um, mm. not only for learning but then for living. And then when you start to see, you start to knock up against all these places where, like you said, the the systems where we don't have choice, and and you start questioning like every single one, don't you? By the end of yeah. it, <laughs> yeah. And I think um, I just I just say to myself, Lucy, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, with the church, I guess where I'm at now is, is holding on to really healthy spirituality, which is uh, really beautiful and really important. I think whatever your spirituality is for, you know, well-being mm-hmm. and, and community and all that sort of things so are holding on to that and then kind of letting uh, the rest of it blow away. So yeah, I say that a lot. Don't, don't throw the baby out of the bathwater loose. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a great point because that was something that helped me when I got to a place where, you know, because because feeling uncomfortable with something didn't automatically mean to reject it, which yeah. I think lines up with your don't throw the baby out with the bathwater yeah. phrasing. And to be able to hold um, my discomfort alongside you know, my um, positive feelings about choice and whatever, so that I could dig deeper. Like when you can hold them both together, that's when you can start to tease out the pieces um, that are helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Like you were saying, alongside the pieces that aren't working for me anymore. So because automatic resistance or knee jerk, knee jerk knows um, aren't, aren't much more useful than blindly following things either, right? Because yeah. you don't understand um, you don't understand yourself better through that process, whether you know we talk about that with our kids, right? Don't try not to automatically say no, maybe you can say yes, but also say yes more with your kids doesn't mean always say yes because there's yeah. no thought and consideration in that either, right? Yeah, but we so want black and white answers, don't we? I know, we do. (laughs) Those rules are so easy, right? (laughs) Yeah, we just want it there in black and white. We just want to be able to go, like, this is how it goes. This is the rule. This is what I need to do in this situation. And, um, yeah, but it's just not really how we are, and it's not really how the world should be. We need to kind of learn to operate in those gray areas and and to be flexible and fluid and resilient, you know, and, and not need that. That sort of sturdy ground under our feet, but to feel really comfortable just floating in the uh, chaotic, unknown, <laughs> grey substance. <laughs> yeah, and like you said before, going back to the, the relationship, right? When you don't know, yeah. yes, no, I'll, I have no rule to follow. Okay, let's look and see um, foundationally how that is going to impact 
that relationship because, you know, when it comes down to it, school years, childhood, those are just, um, just, you know, a flash of, of a lifetime, right? And these are relationships that we're going to have for our whole lifetime. They will always be our child, will always be their parents, no matter the age, right? So that relationship is, is a lifetime thing. So it's so useful to, to keep that as, as your guide. Yeah. Um, so I am curious, what has surprised you most about your journey so far? Okay. Uh, the <laughs> most surprising thing has probably been how unsurprising it has been um, ah. in the sense that it's just been our life lived, I guess. And um, yeah, I, I wonder, I think like maybe a few years ago when we were at the start of this unschooling journey, I think I imagined that with a six-year-old and a four-year-old, we would, um, you know, we'd be rammed with projects and activities and it would be like a non-stop kind of educational life that we're all living together. And and actually, I think that's been the surprise is it's not. It's just we just wake up and we do our thing and uh, we have really fun days and we have those epic days of non-stop projects and making and learning but we also have a huge number of just little bits and bobs in the day da 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 and I think and um, that's the thing that is surprising for others when they sort of see our lives in action <laughs> we just have a really slow really simple life that we're just trying to live uh, with as much uh, time and space and patience and freedom every day and and I just think that the key to that is to not really be doing loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff so that's probably been the the most surprising thing about it is how um, unsurprising it's been. I love the way you describe that because that was a huge revelation for me too. That the concept of time, time and space. When I write about unschooling, I use that phrase so bloody often. Yeah. <laughs> time and space. Cause you, we are so used to go, 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 go. Yeah. I had no clue how much actual time and space we need, you know, that we here, that we would take if given the opportunity. Yeah. Right. To process um, that that downtime, which we used to think of as, you know, lazy or, you know, uh, not doing anything productive, et cetera. How yeah. valuable and important that time is like I had no clue. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, um, you know, it might feel like it takes an hour for everybody to put their shoes on so you can go out <laughs> to the woods. I'm speaking from experience from this morning. Um, but <laughs> that hour is really important because if you feel like you've got an hour for everybody to find their shoes and put them on, you've got space then for the trauma that happens when you can't find socks with the right seams in the right place you know you've got time Mm -hmm. to validate that person's feelings and and hug them until they're ready to move on from that moment um you know you you don't have to snap at people to get them to hurry up and you don't have Mm -hmm. to um forget things because you've all rushed out the door too quickly you can definitely have all the snacks you need you can definitely have the right socks with the right seams and you can definitely all have the space you need to be patient with each other and um and increasingly I see perhaps it, it's um in contrast because we're here in England at the moment and I'm quite busy with lots of different work things and um you know we, we've got hundreds of people it feels like to catch up with while we're here like (laughs) friends and family and so at the moment we are kind of a little bit like go 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 and it's in such stark contrast to our life in the year which is just basically no 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 (laughs) it's just like slow 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 I should say actually you know it's just really really slow and um and here I find myself having a a quickening of the breath and a kind of we don't have time for me to mm-hmm. validate all of these emotions right now you know and I realize <laughs> yeah. how much of my parenting comes down to basically not really doing very much but just 
being really present with your children and having the time to let them feel everything they need to feel and uh, connect with them in all those downtime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that it, that patience to be with them, right? Like you were saying, validate, but the the because that patience keeps your connection with them yeah. and it lets them see in your eyes they see through your patience that you see them yeah right that that um because if we're trying to rush them through things they they really don't feel seen like I mean I'm just yeah. thinking just putting myself um in those spots when when I feel rushed through things exactly you know you 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 have to um, kind of close off part of yourself, don't you? Because yeah. because you can't, you don't have the time to feel yeah. whatever it is that's coming up. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's brilliant. Um, oh, you recently started a group and a website called Parent Allies, and mm-hmm. I have joined. I'm really uh, looking forward to that. And I would love to know the inspiration behind it and a bit about your plans for it. Cool. So... Um, yep, parentallies.org is the website, but there's also a Facebook page and a Facebook group. And the group is probably the bit that I'm most excited about because there's a real community um, rising up around this idea. And the idea is um, taken from social justice movements uh, where there is... In, in every rights movement so far, there's been a group of people who are in the sort of uh, dominant group but have chosen to um, stand next to the marginalised group and advocate for them and support them and be people who uh, will just um, show solidarity and do whatever they can to um allow this group to have their rights met. So you've seen it in the civil rights movement and um, in, you know, all sorts of movements over history. So I've come to believe that children are one of the last um, marginalised groups in society, um, groups where it's really socially accepted to basically marginalise them. So you have conversations on Facebook where people are just like, yeah, I don't like kids. And they're almost proud or cool Mm -hmm. to sort of say it. And there's, um, I really believe that there's quite um, systemic uh, marginalization of children too, just um, in things like not having steps in public toilets so they can reach the taps or reach the toilet without having to climb over this grim thing. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's little, those are a couple of little examples. And the idea is that parents, are invited to be allies to their children, to advocate for their needs and to um, show solidarity with them and, um, you know, see their role as one where they're partnering with their child um, to make sure their rights are fully honoured and upheld. Um, hmm, what else should I say about that? Uh, <laughs> so, so on the website... We are putting out lots of resources for people who are in different situations to share how they are allies to their children. And this is where it's really exciting for me because it's not it, it's moving right out of the education sphere. And I guess um, this is the root of um, the concept of parent allies for me came because I've been writing about unschooling for five years or so. And every time I write about unschooling in terms of respecting children, I have a lot of teachers and mums and dads of children who are at school saying, well, how can I do this at home? Or um, I feel like I do this, but my children do go to school. And so Mm -hmm. um, by talking about parents as allies, we're we're moving out of learning. We're moving into the whole of life, uh, whether you're at school or not at school, um, whether whoever you are in the world, you can be an ally to your child. Um, yeah, so so the website is meant to be a resource for people choosing to be that. Um, and the, the Facebook group is, yeah, really, really supportive group where people can come in and they can ask for advice. So you have to ask for advice. We don't just give it um, willy nilly because we <laughs> sort of realize, well, I, I guess I've identified that that is a bit of a problem in our world. <laughs> We're so quick to give advice rather mm-hmm. than simply hearing someone's story or hearing someone's problem. So um, there's a tag where you can just say solidarity, please. And that's where you can come and you can talk about 
something that's been bothering you or something you're finding really hard without getting any advice. You just get people saying um, love to you or you're doing really well or, you know, just showing solidarity. And then you can also ask for advice and you can also get a high five. So you can go into the group and you can be like, high five. Um, I did really well with my kid today because this has been a bit of a struggle. And I realized that in my role as an ally, I need to help her um, get this need met, you know, and then they'll give details and then everybody will say high five, high five. <laughs> and it's sort of like, um, I guess it meets needs. It meets those needs for parents to be heard um, in a way that is also respectful to their children. Um, and it is a way to receive advice if you're struggling with how to be an ally. I think so often we have, I guess it's the, I don't know really what it is. Maybe it's a thing to do with human nature, but so often parents will think that they've got a problem that can only be solved with a punitive or disrespectful mm -hmm. measure. They think, yeah. um, oh, my, my kid doesn't like brushing their teeth, for example. So the only thing I can do is hold them down and clean their teeth. They sort of, um, you know, they put up their own barriers and they say, there's no other answer. I just, I'm mostly a respectful parent, but in this situation, I have to coerce my child. Um, and the idea of the group is that we kind of crowdsource solutions. So very often people go in there and they're like, my child doesn't want to clean their teeth. And then we can say, oh, I've been there and this worked for me and this worked for me. Because something I found with parenting and problems is that, um, answers one, two, and three don't work, but four and five and six and seven and eight and nine might work. And, mm -hmm. and I really think that in our role as an ally to our child, we can find the patience to look for four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, because it's so important to us to remain connected and remain in partnership and to respect their rights, that we're willing to dig deep for those creative solutions. Yeah, I love that. A little bit. And, yeah, that that's beautiful, and and I love the idea that um, of expanding it, you know, to all parents, because and even you know the I come get a high five kind of deal because you know um, it's still uh, uh, unconventional way to parent, yeah. right? So around them, they're going to be getting some because if they tried to go with with um, that kind of uh, uh, good, how am I trying to say this? They try to share that with like uh, a more conventional friend or whatever. They <laughs> would you know, get yeah. the side eye, like, what the heck did you spend oh, yeah. on? Just tell them to brush their darn teeth. <laughs> yeah, or like, you um, know. Yeah, my child's got a really creative urge to, um, to paint on the wall. So today I dedicated a whole part of the wall so my child could literally just paint the walls. Can I get a high five? You yeah. can imagine having that conversation with a conventional parent and then just being like, you let your child paint on the walls, <laughs> you know, whereas yeah. like in the group, everybody is like, rock on, you're amazing that you could come up with a solution for that urge, you know? Yeah, that works for everyone. Yeah, and um, because... Yeah, you know, we as we were talking before when we were talking about school, there are ways um, if if that's a necessary part of your life, right? There are ways to still respect and and nurture and care for your relationship with your child. Just because school is part of the picture, it doesn't yeah. mean all your relationship has to be about control. Exactly, and um, and I used to find myself writing. Um, to unschoolers and unschoolers at heart and what I mean by that was people who loved all of this rights respecting freedom loving stuff but did for whatever reason have to send their children to school and um, and I guess that was really why I tried really hard to come up with a term to describe um, all of the people that are wanting to live this way with their children whether their kids are at school or not because certainly we need parents and teachers with within the education system, which I believe is incredibly coercive and oppressive. We need people in there standing up for children and saying, you know what, it is a child's right to go to the toilet when they need to go to the toilet. You know, we need allies mm -hmm. within the education system. 
My kids are having fun, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure you can probably hear them and it sounds horrible and terrifying, but they're all gleeful sounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Oh, and I was going to mention uh, Emma and I, we do a, a book chat every couple of months and we're, do, we're reading uh, The Childism book. Oh, cool. I forget. I forget her name, Elizabeth. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. And I will have links to um, your Facebook group and your website and all that stuff as well. So I think that's awesome. People are going to have a lot of fun checking that out. Oh, cool. And, yay. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It was it was a lot of fun to finally get to chat with you, Lucy. Yeah, totally. I feel kind of like, um, you know, we're, we're basically friends now rather than people who know a little bit about each other from the internet <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I was very much looking forward to chatting with yeah you. <laughs> it's been really lovely to be on here so thank you so much for having me yay and before we go where is the best place for people to connect with you online oh um I would probably say YouTube um is people find me really um personable on YouTube for some reason it's uh, kind of a new channel and I've been writing for seven years but only doing YouTube for um, a couple of years but I think people find uh, videos really helpful in a way that perhaps writing isn't so um yeah so mm -hmm. I'm on YouTube with my channel Lulastic and the Hippie Shake and I update that really regularly like every single week whereas other parts of the internet I'm slightly more like I pop in and pop out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. I will definitely have the link to your channel there as well. Cool. Thank you very much and have a great day. Have fun with the kids. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the first book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Learn, Five Ideas for a Joyful Unschooling Life. In it, I share the five paradigm-changing ideas that most help me better understand unschooling. Reviewers have said, a quick read, but packed with ideas that challenge the dominant paradigm of our failing approach to learning, this little gem makes an excellent argument for unschooling. And, I was rather doubtful about this book, as I had never heard of the author, but after reading it, I wish that I had read it years ago. I hope you find it helpful too. Free to Learn has also been translated into French and Spanish. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.